In the last six months, I have spent over 250 hours spread across Destiny 2, Warframe, and The First Descendant. Whilst I undeniably enjoy the looter shooter genre and was already very familiar with it, having played everything from Destiny and The Division to Anthem and Fallout 76, I chose to spend my time with these games in service of two projects for the channel. The first of which is today's video. You see, I believe that many people fundamentally fail to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the live service looter shooter. That the majority of players may spend time with one or two of these games and walk away incorrectly thinking that they know what separates a great one from a mediocre one. Or even worse, that there are no great ones. However, rather than make such bold claims knowing that much of what I said can't be proven without a thorough study of looter shooters, I took it upon myself to dive headfirst into the genre. I chose to meet each of these games on their own terms. After all, it'd been years since I had played either Destiny or Warframe, and the first Descendant was a long-awaited competitor to both. And unlike my peers, I take pride in a willingness to challenge my own assumptions. I assumed that these games had not grown a lot since my time with them, and that the first Descendant would feel cheap and half-baked. In challenging those assumptions for myself, I've developed not only a deeper appreciation for these games, but for the genre as a whole. But before I say any more, I think it's important that I establish where they originate from. I think the best way to do this is to describe the concept as it was first described to us many years ago. Think Borderlands meets World of Warcraft. The idea was to take the core gameplay of something like Borderlands, with its first-person shooting, unique character classes, and mountains of loot, and combine it with the progression and cooperative elements found in massively multiplayer online RPGs like World of Warcraft. That's it. That was the pitch for Destiny 1 as it was first described to us all those years ago. And as a fan of both MMOs and Borderlands, I couldn't have been more excited. Whether you can recognize the elements of Borderlands or WoW in the modern looter shooter isn't really that important. But what is important is that you understand what the first of these games were trying, and on some level failing, to do. Starting with what was arguably the first and the most well-known of these games, Destiny. Part 1 Now let me be clear, I have played Destiny on and off throughout its life, and have spent a substantial amount of time with it over the years. And even now, I do have a fondness for its gunplay and world. However, until recently, I hadn't played since the launch of Destiny 2. It had simply left me shocked to see a great game fumble after years of improvement, and so I moved on. Despite that, I went into Destiny 2 this time around with enthusiasm and an open mind. But after a hundred hours spent with it, I was so conflicted about the game that I just couldn't bring myself to spend any more money or time on it. But let's talk about the good things first. Destiny has some of the best first-person shooting in all of gaming, and in my opinion, that's really what has carried it for so long. Well, that and the incredible art direction. Seriously, the artists never fail to cook with this game. So shooting feels great, the enemies feel great to shoot at, and the places where you shoot them look great. I also appreciate that despite having a very casual appeal, it's actually not afraid to kill you. It's never challenging in particularly interesting ways in my opinion, but I don't die much when playing games even when screwing around, so I appreciate a game that kills me as frequently as Destiny can. But unfortunately, that's really where my praise for the game ends. Which brings me to the long list of problems I have with Destiny 2. Its new player experience is abysmally convoluted despite having fairly simple systems. The class and build diversity is still quite underbaked despite years of development. And on top of that, every class and subclass just feels like playing slightly different flavors of Halo. Titans aren't really tanks, hunters aren't really assassins, and warlocks aren't really mages. They're honestly all quite bland, and were it not for the introduction of Strand, I really wouldn't have had much fun with the combat after the first 20 or so hours. In my experience, the movement and encounter design in Destiny felt so tedious without my silly grapple that a big part of why I didn't pick up the final shape is because Titans don't have access to it when using the new subclass. I couldn't imagine going back to just running around and shooting after having had the joy of grappling into a horde and punching everything to death. The limitations placed on my Titan are a direct reflection of my issues with the build crafting. So in Destiny, build crafting is kind of a mixed bag. It's not terribly deep, and it's very rare that anything novel is discovered after the first few days with new abilities or equipment. However, it's also fairly easy to understand given that on the gear side of things, you only have two pieces that make a substantial impact. This is because the most interesting weapons and armor fall under the exotic rarity, and you're only allowed to equip one exotic weapon and one exotic piece of armor at a time. Basically, all of Destiny Buildcraft is mixing and matching these two pieces from hundreds of choices and making sure they complement your subclass which we've already talked about. While some exotics are genuinely interesting, as are some of the quests to get them, they generally only have one unique ability and most are rather straightforward or not terribly strong. As for progression, it's as follows. 
the new expansion or patch drops, and then a few days later the challenge mode version of the raid comes out. Now what's so strange is that this is basically the hardest piece of content at the hardest it will ever be. So after you've beaten that, there's not really a reason to collect more gear other than for the sake of it. You've already beaten the only challenge that you'd need more gear for. If you aren't pushing for that, then you'll just clear the raid with gear you get from weekly activities and then clear it again on master difficulty, which is still easier than challenge mode. Any decent player is in the same spot just a couple weeks later. This wouldn't be a problem if raids were not a substantial chunk of endgame content, or making them didn't take a lot of development time and resources. But they are, and they do. So as a result, the rest of the content isn't particularly interesting or fleshed out. Because Destiny relies so heavily on the quality of its gunplay, it demands a lot of variety in the encounter designs and content to keep things fresh, which require the same resources I just mentioned being integral to having raids. This is precisely why so few games offer proper raiding. In an attempt to remedy the issue, Destiny raids often sacrifice quality and complexity for the sake of appealing to casual players, because there isn't enough content and variety to satisfy that audience otherwise. If you think this is a good system for progression and content delivery, then I implore you to spend time with actual MMOs like World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV. Both games have faced this same issue at times, and both have only managed to succeed for so long by overcoming it. We'll use WoW as an example since I'm far more familiar with it. When a new raid comes out, most raid teams will start by clearing it on normal difficulty. Depending on the team, that may take several weeks for a casual raid team, but for people accustomed to the higher difficulties, it's one or two raid nights. Heroic difficulty is where the bulk of raiding occurs, and for casual raiders, this takes several weeks or months to clear. Each week getting as far as they can, taking the gear they've earned, and using it to push even further before the next weekly reset. Now Mythic difficulty is an entirely different beast that few players step into, much less get through, but it sits at the top for the very best to push themselves. The best teams in the world will take several days or upwards of a week in the Mythic World First race, and the rest of us in the top 5% or so will take between several weeks and several months to clear it. My point in explaining this is so that you can see why someone who raids would continually chase the next increase in power. It's specifically to facilitate taking on even harder content. And that treadmill lasts at least several weeks or months for most players, as many teams will try pushing into the next difficulty up and work on that until the next raid releases. As opposed to Destiny, in which a raid is something you complete in a matter of hours, and where the reason to keep playing after getting the raid exotic is to just keep chasing down more goofy guns. Like what function does a god roll serve in Destiny if you never need one to clear the hardest content? None that I can see. Lastly, Destiny is stupidly overpriced. The price of old content is too high, it expects a substantial investment from the player once a year, and is still bloated with microtransactions. It cost me well over $100 to get all of the base gameplay content even on sale, and it would have cost another 100 to stay up to date with the final shape. And perhaps most egregious, I wanted a skimmer because it looked and in fact is incredibly fun to play with, but missed the limited time event for a free one. So I had to buy mine in a $20 bundle. Though I heard you can now buy it outside of the bundle, whoopee. You know how we were literally like, it should have a jump? It has a jump. <laughs> oh, and you know how Bruce, we were talking, is like, there's like a trick to make the sparrows fly? Mm -hmm. What trick? Who, who needs a trick? <laughs> it just flies. Okay, like, and it's, so, so my point is though, is it's fun. And it's like, it's really fun. Everybody should get one of these. It's really stupid that something that they put this much effort into and is so much fun was behind a limited time event for the time being and a bundle for you. Like, that's mm -hmm. so it's so dumb. Anyway, I just <laughs> of all the games I'm going to mention today, this is by far the most expensive and least rewarding. And to compare them fairly, I spent roughly the same amount on Warframe and slightly less on the first Ascendant. Call me crazy, but if we're going to compare experiences, then I'm not going to compare two free-to-play experiences against a premium triple-digit purchase. Despite how it may be coming across, I'm not trying to say that Destiny is a bad game. In fact, I'm trying to highlight its flaws to say that in spite of them, and the many ups and downs over the years, it's a very popular game with a lot of loyal fans. I'm not saying there's nothing to like about Destiny 2 either, or that it doesn't offer plenty of appeal to a very particular type of player. I personally think Crucible and Trials PvP are a ton of fun, and I really enjoy the more involved exotic quests. I'm just saying that no one who has only played or chooses to primarily play Destiny 2 is in any position to criticize the other games featured in this video. You see, neither the first live service looter shooter nor any game since has truly managed to succeed in capturing the strength of both its inspirations. And so rather than look to MMOs like World of Warcraft, I believe the best of these games instead chose to look at another Blizzard game brimming with loot and RPG mechanics. Diablo. 
You may be wondering why this wasn't the first place they looked, as Borderlands already borrows much from Diablo in the way of its character classes and mountains of multicolored loot. And the truth is, they did. While Destiny was trying to blend the first-person shooter with the MMO, a much lesser-known game was combining the third-person shooter with the action RPG at around the same time. It just took longer for people to notice. Which brings me to a game that has been going for just about as long as Destiny while aging far more gracefully. Warframe. Now, Warframe is the game we're going to use as a baseline for what these games do well, because I really believe that in basically every measurable way, it's a far better example of the genre than Destiny. So for starters, Warframe is built around collecting and mastering its variety of classes, or Warframes. Each Warframe is essentially a character class unto itself, and the catch is that pretty much all of the frames must be crafted with resources you get by playing the game. The idea is really simple, as you're basically playing the game to unlock and craft new ways of playing the game. The build diversity amongst the frames themselves is somewhat lacking, but with every frame playing differently and there being so many to choose from, that's not really a big deal. Especially when you factor in the wide assortment of weapons to play with. While the new player experience is convoluted, it guides the player a lot better than Destiny 2, and the story explains itself to the player much better in my opinion. However, that could just be the result of not deleting past expansions from the game. Now, there are some elements of Warframe that are less than ideal, for example its monetization. While the game is entirely free to play, its robust shop and the use of timers across a number of systems can give the feel of a more predatory mobile game. Though most players make thorough use of player trading, through which the entire monetization model becomes far more reasonable, it doesn't make a good first impression in that regard. But all in all, I think that Warframe serves as a great example for what the core of a looter shooter should look like, and that's without getting into the insane variety of content and all the different types of gameplay it experiments with. Now that we've talked about what I think many people would agree are the two pillars of the genre, I think it's time we get to a game that draws heavily from both. And that brings me to The First Descendant, which is basically a brand new entry to the genre and one which makes no effort to hide its inspirations. For all intents and purposes, The First Descendant is modeled almost exactly off of Warframe, at least in regards to its core systems and progression. The build crafting and progression are very similar, but a good bit more straightforward for new players. The business model and monetization is likewise very similar to Warframe's, though to my surprise, it's actually a fair bit less aggressive right now. The biggest difference is in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay which feels far more akin to a third-person Destiny. The shooting is far more prevalent and also quite refined, even if it's not really on par with Destiny. But it's likewise good at offering a meaningful challenge throughout. The story is probably the least interesting of the three, but it's presented well. The only bad thing I have to say about The First Descendant is that it's so incredibly derivative that it can feel a bit weird at times, like it's a knockoff of other games, but it's a very good knockoff. At the start, I laid out my assumptions before playing, and while I don't think The First Descendant is half-baked, it does feel kind of cheap and definitely has the style over substance issue that is prevalent in a lot of Korean games. On paper, it does everything right, but I do think that generally speaking, it doesn't feel as good to play as Destiny and isn't nearly as fast and stylish as Warframe. I will say that while the monetization of these games didn't ever impact my overall enjoyment, I do think that the way Destiny splits up actual content and gameplay is a bit predatory. And though I do think Destiny feels overpriced, part of that is the pricing structure. It actually costs a similar amount to play as WoW or Final Fantasy XIV if you play year-round, it's just more that the upfront cost is really off-putting, especially if you aren't committed to playing throughout the year. The only game here I'm really skeptical of is The First Descendant, as their publisher has a habit of making their games far more predatory in the monetization over time. While many people look at the live service model as a form of cynical cash grab, and it certainly has been used for that, it can also facilitate some amazing games when managed well. And if you scoff or roll your eyes at that, then might I remind you that I am not partial to or even remotely focused on this genre. One look at the other videos on my channel should make it clear that I genuinely play games of every kind and far more than most people or even other content creators. The core concept is really quite ambitious and simple to understand, but if you like a game, if you and your friends like playing it, then wouldn't you want that game to keep adding content and features? It worked for MMOs and the king of them is still alive and kicking to this day. And I believe, the fact that Destiny was the first live service looter shooter and remained the most popular for so many years in spite of its many flaws, is the reason the genre remains so misunderstood to this day. Free to play and live service is supposed to be a way for developers to be able to deliver a smaller product and grow it over time. Be able to deliver a valuable service, a valuable product, and grow it while the community supports it. And that's the kind of game that Warframe is. Part 2 In the last six months, I have spent over 500 hours playing live service looter shooters. Whilst I undeniably enjoy the genre and was already very familiar with it, having played everything from Destiny and The Division to Anthem and Fallout 76, I chose to spend my time with these games in service of two projects for the channel, the first of which is today's video. 
You see, I believe that many people fundamentally fail to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the live service looter shooter. That the majority of players may spend time with one or two of these games and walk away incorrectly thinking that they know what separates a great one from a mediocre one. Or even worse, that there are no great ones. Just days before the release of Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, I found myself at a crossroads. I didn't have high expectations for the game and had planned to skip it. However, I saw little mention or footage of the gameplay on YouTube and Twitter despite there being a lot of negativity. I understood well enough that people were annoyed it was a looter shooter, but I'm all for developers taking risks and trying new things. Between that and a single comment from a beta tester who said it was like a game I have fond memories of, Sunset Overdrive, I was suddenly on the fence. If I was going to cover the game, I needed to start playing it as soon as it came out. But at the same time, playing it day one meant spending $100 for the deluxe version in early access. My friend Lemon can confirm that I agonized over this decision the night before and the morning of the game's physical release. I had every reason to suspect that it wasn't going to be very good. I was and still am not in a position to spend $100 lightly, and I don't want to make videos about games I don't enjoy. But I was also legitimately suspicious of the negativity surrounding it when critics and content creators seemed hesitant to show or discuss the gameplay. Likewise, what little I had seen and heard of the gameplay made me genuinely curious about how it played. So with very little to go on other than my own instincts, I chose to challenge my own assumptions and take a chance on a game that by all accounts was doomed to be a disaster. And had I waited and listened to the critics and content creators I trust most, I would have skipped what is now my favorite leader shooter ever made. As I stated in my first video on Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, I believe that the game was wrongfully lambasted by dishonest or uninformed critics who failed to meet it on its own terms. Six months and 250 hours later, I stand by that statement. Suicide Squad was hated because it's a live service looter shooter, not because it failed to capture the merits of that genre. And now, I can prove it. Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League isn't an outright disaster. It's better than Marvel's Avengers, especially with the loot and combat mechanics. It's better than Anthem at launch, post-launch is a toss-up. It's better than Redfall when considering overall polish. It's all damning with faint praise though. It's not bad, it's just disappointing from Rocksteady, pioneers of single-player story action chasing already outdated multiplayer trends. My most charitable reading of it is that Rocksteady are attempting weaponized incompetence. Whoops, the looter shooter you forced us to make sucks balls. Oh well, guess it's back to the world-class groundbreaking single-player games with us. It ought to be left as a footnote in Rocksteady's history, forgotten to time so they can make games again that at least pretend to have a soul. Almost every single problem Suicide Squad has can be blamed on the fact it's carrying this live service dead weight on its back. All right. Kill this full price live service poison that's infested gaming for over a decade before it spreads even further. You done yet? The live service model makes a story based video game more grindy, more dull, more empty, and more exhausting by design. Suicide Squad was dead on arrival because it's a game nobody asked for, made in a way nobody wanted. Bro still going. Clearly, the games industry didn't get the message the last time we beat the shit out of the cancerous glop. I wonder how he feels about live services. And while a pylon never feels nice, sometimes it's downright necessary. We'll start with the story and writing in Suicide Squad, seeing as that's where the majority of hate and criticism was being directed even before the game's release. But first, let's talk about the story and writing in other looter shooters as a point of comparison. Warframe's story has grown into something special, and Destiny has likewise grown into a decent narrative over the course of many years. However, both of those games had virtually non-existent stories at the start which only improved with half a decade of updates. The First Descendant is a much more honest look at what the stories and its predecessors were like early on, and well yeah, it's nonsense. A bunch of mystical sci-fi exposition and proper nouns that don't mean anything. All in all, stories have never been the looter shooter genre's strongest element, but given time, they tend to become something special, or at the very least, decent. By comparison, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League has a much better written and delivered story than any other looter shooter did at launch, and it's no contest. For starters, let's debunk a huge myth about it. The Justice League is a lie. Now, I and many others have been saying as much since the game launched, but apparently all the massive hints and bits of foreshadowing weren't enough for some of the slower folks out there. Fortunately, we no longer have to rely on them to think for themselves because the game has proven us right with the release of Season 2. After defeating this episode's iteration of Brainiac, we rescue the Flash. So yeah, for anyone who's been put off of the game by spoilers, I can confidently say that you were misled by half-wit journalists and content creators who don't know what foreshadowing means or how storytelling works. 
I've maintained since the beginning that Suicide Squad is actually a remarkably well-written game, and seeing as it duped a bunch of so-called critics with a basic plot twist, I think it speaks for itself. It should be pretty clear to anyone being honest that the storytelling of Suicide Squad may be imperfect given it suffers from the same narrative issues that delivering an ongoing story like this always does, but it's a far cry from the flat and exposition-heavy stories of his peers. I had no previous interest or connection to the characters in Suicide Squad before playing the game, and in general I'm not a big fan of comic book characters or stories. And yet, I enjoyed my time with the game's version of these characters so much that I've become a fan of them outside the game and consider Harley Quinn one of my favorite characters in media now. With the story out of the way, I'd now like to talk about the gameplay, and I can think of no better way to open than by disproving some of the most widely spread lies about the game's combat. For starters, I need to dispel this bullshit. Why do you just run around and shoot? Why do they all just use guns? Ignoring the fact that the characters are mostly separated by their unique traversal mechanics and that you should never be just running around and shooting for more than a few seconds, let me demonstrate how untrue this is. Alright, so I was editing this section while I was talking with my friend Lemon, and I was trying to get some footage when I realized I, in the moment, had just done a better demonstration of the point I'm trying to make than I could ever explain. So, as you'll see here, I'm about to disable my left, uh, left trigger on my controller so that I can't shoot anymore. And uh, we're going to take on an incursion above mastery level 200, and it's going to take us just over 60 seconds. All right, let's go. Now guns are one of the many ways you will fight enemies, and they always serve a purpose, but they grow more supplementary as each character gets stronger and you learn how to craft builds. The point is that if you see someone just running around on the ground shooting at things, they probably don't know how to play the game or they're trying to make it look boring. Moving on, here's some footage of games where all you do is run around shooting things. In all seriousness though, you can and will spend time shooting in all of these games, but Suicide Squad and Warframe definitely offer far more gameplay variety than Destiny or The First Ascendant. The latter two are games where you will be frequently dumping magazine after magazine of bullets into enemies with little to mix it up aside from where to shoot and how much you need to move. And of the pair, I feel Destiny does a much better job including variety in the encounters. I could give specific examples to prove these points, but frankly, I couldn't be bothered when the footage should make it very apparent. On to the next stupid thing I hear way too frequently. Why doesn't Captain Boomerang use his boomerang? There are entire builds which focus on using this boomerang throwing attack, and even the ones that don't will still make regular use of it to apply debuffs, harvest shield, and break armor. Speaking of which, I think now is the perfect time to talk about build crafting and progress. Suicide Squad likewise leans into the Warframe slash Diablo model of simply providing fast and engaging combat combined with the extrinsic motivation of loot and scaling difficulties to satisfy more goal-oriented players. All three games have you collect gear to make builds, that allow you to challenge harder content, to collect more gear, and to play with different builds. Aside from pushing mastery levels higher and trying to climb the leaderboard, Suicide Squad derives its progression from a desire to simply keep engaging with the combat. The core gameplay loop is so solid and so well crafted that all Rocksteady needs to do is continue offering more ways and excuses to engage with said combat, which comes in the form of this game's exciting approach to gear. Every time a new infamy set and new notorious pieces come out, the entire build crafting meta changes and countless new builds become viable. For comparison, infamy gear in Suicide Squad is basically a set of matching exotics from Destiny but way more powerful. 
and Notorious pieces are basically like Giga Exotics with extra special abilities that trigger based on which Infamy sets you have equipped. And on top of that, you can equip however many of them you have room for. The vast majority of the gear I just mentioned works in tandem with the characters and their variety of unique talents, and when you combine it all to get the absolute most out of their playstyles and gameplay, I really believe the results elevate Suicide Squad above the majority of its peers. Which brings me back to why I believe the core gameplay is so solid. Movement. Suicide Squad may share a handful of combat mechanics with its peers, but one thing that truly sets it apart and makes it such a fun game is its absolute focus on movement. While the whole cast has access to similar offensive options, each character's playstyle is defined almost entirely by how they move. And move they do. Between Joker's rocket-powered umbrella that doubles as a flying skateboard, Freeze's Frozone-inspired ice paths, and the original four traversal kits, this game is now the undisputed master of third-person movement mechanics in my eyes. Traversal is the beating heart of Suicide Squad, and is so integral to the gameplay that changing from one character to the next to endgame is genuinely akin to playing a different game. For all intents and purposes, each character is an entirely unique class made distinct by how they move and which damage options they favor. While it's undeniably a looter shooter, it's far more focused on movement and fast-paced decision making over anything else. I'd even go so far as to argue that it's the most innovative third-person shooter in recent memory for this very reason. I've said since launch that the gameplay and mechanical depth on offer is far and away the most impressive I've seen from a looter shooter debut. What held the game back aside from technical issues and dishonest criticism was the lack of progression on offer at endgame. Now I'll be the first to admit that at launch we only had three missions to rotate through as we pushed through the mastery levels and it was pretty lackluster when sat alongside the mediocre boss fight and poorly spaced killing time map. While that's certainly not enough to support a hardcore player base for very long, it's also not any less than what I've come to expect from the early days of any title in the genre. I won't beat a dead horse, but we would have been kissing the ground beneath Bungie's feet if in year one of either Destiny game they delivered even a fraction of the content now available in Suicide Squad. But just to drive my point home, let's go over how much has been added to the game since launch. For starters, we now have two additional characters with the inclusion of Joker and Mrs. Freeze. Not only are these characters incredibly well designed, they both offer what could arguably be the two best traversal kits in the game. Aside from the additional characters and the massive amount of content that is simply having entirely new classes to play with, there are now 12 different sets of Infamy gear to chase as well as dozens of Notorious pieces. They've also added Master 2 through 5 versions of gear gated behind the higher mastery level incursions and corrupted gear to incentivize doing the boss fights, both of which serve to extend the endgame loot pursuit in a straightforward but compelling way. With the recent release of Season 2, it feels like Rocksteady have finally found their footing. I'm hopeful that means we'll see a new type of content or activity next season now that they've worked out the kinks and made adjustments based on player feedback. Having said all this, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that performance and how it impacts your own experience can vary greatly from person to person. My friends had fewer issues with Destiny on PC than myself, but the first Descendant and Suicide Squad have both been uneven or even unplayable for them at times. At one point, Suicide Squad basically broke on PC with the Season 1 update, taking weeks to fix. But on the flip side, I've had virtually no issues with Suicide Squad on PS5 in the 6 months I've been playing it. I'm not trying to claim that Suicide Squad is a game that runs impeccably well, or that it didn't have a substantial number of technical issues at launch and in its first few months. Believe me, I've seen them myself. But now 6 months on, I do think it's fair to say that performance is acceptable and on par with its peers, especially given the outstanding quality of its presentation relative to these other games. Since the very beginning, I have maintained that Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is a good, maybe even great game. That more than anything, it simply needed the time and support necessary for it to grow. Time and support that every successful live service looter shooter has been granted in excess. And even if you disagree, in all likelihood you currently love a live service that got its second chance. Most of the popular ones have. So then why shouldn't this game myself and thousands of others love get the same? My goal when making this video and covering these games was to confront my own assumptions, to challenge my own confidence in Suicide Squad as a game and looter shooters as a genre. I went into all four of the looter shooters covered in this video with an open mind, modest expectations, and knowing full well that I might actually be wrong. But 500 hours later, I believe now more than ever that the live service looter shooter genre has been wrongfully blamed for the festering greed and growing player discontent that eats away at the heart of this industry. The problem with the modern video game industry is the same as it's always been. It's largely run by short-sighted, profit-driven executives at the top of publicly traded companies. All the rest of the hate and toxicity dripping from video game discourse is just a byproduct of the grifters and reactionaries that bait you with outrage in order to line their own pockets. 
for those of us who love games, for those of us who actually play them and appreciate all that they are and can be, there's more great games now than ever before. I sincerely believe that Suicide Squad stands as a testament to exactly that. At the end of the day, I love playing video games. I've loved playing the games for this project, and I've loved my time with Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. And more than anything, I hope that if enough of you give it a try, maybe I'll get to keep enjoying it for the foreseeable future. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. This is also the first video I've released since becoming a YouTube partner, so if you'd like to support the channel, you can now do so by becoming a member down below. I'm sure some of you have just been dying to give me money, right? Right?